Hey, how you folks doing? My name is James Clem. I live in Santa Rosa, California. There's some recent fires there, but it's we're okay. Most of the people are okay, but there's a lot of people that are suffering as well. But we have to adapt, right? And that's why we're doing this virtually. This convention is virtual because we just can't travel the way we used to, but one day I'm sure we're going to get back to it. But I'm happy to be with you folks. I've been a proud CIRC user for 15 years. I use it for a lot of clinical applications, and it's been very rewarding for me in my practice. I could not imagine practicing without it. Today's topic is about applying the CIRC system in the smile zone. I'm going to touch on some pointers that I think are really important for success. And that is learning systems before we ever prep the case to get closure with the patient, understanding what the expectations are so we can have a good outcome. And then we're going to review the software workflow that has worked best for me for the last few years. I like to work in systems and the flow so we don't have to repeat what we do when we're designing so that way we know when we're done and we can get a really predictable outcome. And then we're going to talk about some material choices. That could be a full lecture, but I'm going to touch on just some things that I think are really important when choosing between a microfels pathic, a lucite, a lithium disilicate, or even zirconia. It's getting more aesthetic now. And then my favorite is texturing in ceramics once they're out of the milling unit, applying primary, secondary, anatomy enhancements, and then the surface texture. Seamless clinical templates to set a case up for success. And a lot of that has to do with understanding the workflow we're gonna do, particularly before we start the case, and that's understanding the harmony with the patient. And that is their emotional aspect, what they're looking for, what are the expectations. And then we think about the biomechanics of the mouth. What's the aging aspect? Do they have a lot of wear and tear on those sensatile edges? Are they horizontal chewers? Are they vertical chewers? What are they going to do to the restorations once they're restored? Particularly if there's premature aging. I use that word a lot with clients, premature aging. We look at the soft tissue, the tooth physique, which is the silhouette, the form and shape of what we want to accomplish for the patient, and then using materials to have the best outcome for what we want to do for the case. Whenever I'm looking at a case now, I have a lot of clients that want really conservative preps. Are you getting that? They don't want their teeth ground down. So in many cases today, I'm using a higher strength ceramic and I'm using minimal preps and sometimes no preps based on the case. We can machine that today. We have the ability to machine it and we have the materials to machine that. But I need to really understand the patient very well and that is I need a prototype, I need a mock-up, I need a wax-up to make sure I know what we can accomplish for the objectives of the case. It helps me to determine the type of preps I'm going to do. It also will help me get emotional closure. It helps me to determine the shade shift that we want to do, the material choices, and particularly with enamel preservation. What I want to do is have a mock-up so I know how to prepare. That's really important because the thickness of your ceramics, particularly on 8 and 9, those centrals need to be the same thickness, particularly if the underlining color of the prep is the same. So we have to know what we're getting into when we're doing that. The emotional side of smiles. I'm going to call it smile appeal. It's the balance of philosophy dealing with the beauty and taste so it relates to the initial feelings that's emotional when you look at something. So that's what this is all about is getting that emotional closure. Here's a case where we got emotional closure. This is a mock-up. It's made from a Siltec jig from a wax-up or a digital wax-up. And we place that in the mouth using Luxatemp. I usually use B1. That's my favorite. It's not too bright, nor is it too dark. And then we let the patient look at that. And we take pictures. And it helps us with the emotional closure for the case. Now, you can do that if it's additive. So, in other words, if we're making the teeth a little fuller, which I do in a lot of my cases, we know this is going to work. But this is Mark. I want to get acquainted with Mark because Mark was a special case. He allowed me to film the process. I want to go through his emotional closure. This is a video. It's about five minutes long. 
and I think it will explain very well what patients go through and what we need to do and also how we react to the patient to make sure it works really well. With the ease of it, with the actors themselves. Sure. That silicone putty is Siltec from Ivoclar Vivadent. We make that from a mock-up or a prototype which would be a wax-up or a digital printed model. I do lace the Siltec jig at the soft tissue lines so it's easy to clean up the flash. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we're going to have some fun here. I, my first impression is I love them. Uh -huh. You rock. Shade too. I like to say it on him. Yeah. Because you have total privacy here. Yeah. You feel okay? Say hi to Mark. Oh, that's gracious. <laughs> I, I don't... I, I'm... You can get closer if you want. It's, it, I, it's, it, I don't know what, I don't, I'm a little speechless. say it sounds right. <laughs> I cannot overemphasize how important it is to get through that phase. Here's a wax up. This is before I was doing digital wax ups, but this illustrates the point of the case. Digital wax ups work well. Uh, if you don't have the software, there's several lab technicians that I know who can do the wax ups for you and print it for you, or if you have a printer, you can accomplish it that way. But that is working quite well in the industry today. So when you're looking at a case like this, prep is everything. We're going to go fairly conservative. The important thing when I'm doing veneers is I want at least 50% or more of enamel on that surface and that will provide a long-term adhesive assembly. I've done veneers for over 30 years in my practice. I remember in the early 90s when we started to prep a little more aggressively. When I reflect back on that now, that's the situations that I see delaminating maybe 10 to 15 years out of where we just didn't have enough enamel there. And I know that Denton does have initial high bond strength but it's not really reliable for a long-term bond strength so I really am gravitating back to more conservative preps where I can have more enamel because I feel like it's just going to work a lot better for the outcome and this is lithium disilicate this was done over two days so I prepped one day and seeded it the next day so this is right after cementation but the illustration here is that it's all about the workflow we want to get a workflow that's predictable before we start because it's going to dictate how we prepare it's going to dictate how we propose this was done with biocopy so we took the prototype and reproduced that for the final outcome the other thing i look for is the biofunctional aspect of the case how do they chew are their anterior teeth worn is there wear and tear from the lingual? Are the teeth shorter than they used to be? Because that's going to have a big impact on how you finish the case. I look at the CBCT now. This is actually my joint. You can see the beaking and some arthritis in that joint. My jaw is actually 
compressed back in the socket. So it, with that beaking and that position, these are people that usually have more grind issues. That's what I've seen in the journey of my career and it's really good to be aware of that. There are templates and lists that I go through, but I wanna talk a little bit about soft tissue and the soft tissue lines. Soft tissue lines are impacted by the smile plane. So let's talk about that first. The F point and the most important component of a smile plane is right there at the midline. It's the middle eight millimeters. If we can get that onto the face, everything else will work. Here we see asymmetry. The centrals are not the same size. The laterals are not the same size, but yet there's harmony in the case. So if we get the midline on to the long axis of the face, it's gonna work. I spent a lot of time looking at this before we do a mock-up is how is the midline to the long axis of the face? I'm more concerned about that, whether it's one side or the other. So I don't care if the midline's off to right to left, but I want that midline to be on. And it's something that we definitely need to correct if we're gonna get a good outcome. When we plan a case, we're not necessarily looking for perfect symmetry. So when we deal with the soft tissue, I want to get that zenith down first with a laser or mucal osseous surgery. So we're going to outline the soft tissue first and then we prep accordingly. Now in this case, you'll see that the midline and the emergence of those centrals are not the same. It's the larger root trunk that always dictates where we go. So on a smaller root trunk, we want to drop that margin a little bit more. This will be on the upper right central. So we can ramp out that ceramic a little fuller to get more symmetry at the midline. But look at the laterals. They're not the same size. This is intentionally accomplished within a case to create more harmony. And the final outcome was very pleasing for that patient. The other thing I want to mention about a prototype is that it helps us to know how to prep. And what do I mean by that? We're going to use the Siltec jig, fill it with Loxatemp, and place that over the teeth to be prepared, particularly when we're doing conservative veneers. In this case, we filled out the teeth with the mock-up, and this is how we're able to keep our preps in enamel, by planning it so we can have a fuller look, do the reduction through the mock-up, making sure our reduction is even, when I'm doing veneers, this is real important to use this approach. It will be very predictable and the outcomes will really be nice. So getting back to the prototype. The prototype will direct our communication to the patient. It directs our prep style. It directs the final shape of the final restorations. So you can see how important a prototype is before we actually go into a case. We're going to use this case to highlight our prepping video. This is Steve. He's been in my practice for quite a few years, and I've watched him go through some health issues with acid erosion. That's now under control. What we want to do is refurbish his mouth. There's several things we had to accomplish. Number one is we lost him vertical because of the enamel wear and tear. So we're going to restore the vertical. This case I used to prime scan with. We milled out prepless onlays and veneers to build him back into a functional mode. We call this a transitional period that allows us to assess how the patient's going to handle a different vertical and make occlusal adjustments accordingly. So when we get to the final case, it's really easy to do. So in the software, we take the scan at the vertical we want. This is for the transitional onlays. We draw the margins at the height of contour, and we're going to do two arches here. We're going to design the upper arch first to get our curve of Spee and Wilson in, which is pretty flat. This is a class three patient. And then we'll design the lower arch to fit the upper arch using the same sequence. And we'll design really thin onlays and veneers to bond into the mouth. What's nice with a composite material, here we use TeleoCAD is that you can mill it really, really thin and then bond that in. So here we have a digital workflow where we're doing a functional mock-up and then we're gonna take that into the mouth. We're gonna finish them on digitally printed models. And this is how we finished the phase one treatment. The patient was able to function and establish a comfortable chewing cycle and comfort with this vertical. Then we'll go into the restorative component of the case. Our first phase was to prep the upper eight teeth. That provides 
occlusal stability with those molars to hold the bite in place. And this is how I do a lot of my comprehensive care is I'll section in the care to make sure that the bite remains stable and very predictable. The final restorations were a little bright. This is done with amber mill. This is right after cementation. They're going to tone down a little bit once they become hydrated. But let's go into the prep video. A favorite workhorse burr that I use anteriorly is a 1.6 chamfer. I know at 1.6, here I want to reduce 0.8 to 1 millimeter. We're going to drop that burr about half the depth of the burr to get the initial reduction grooves. Now here we have the video sped up a bit so we can get through this video in due time. I'm starting on the lateral and canines for this reason. The centrals are a reference to me. So when I'm observing the preps, I have the reference of the centrals. And that helps me with my overall contouring and shaping of my preps. In this case, we're gonna be providing full crowns mainly because of the acid erosion on the lingual from long-term acid reflux. So we're not doing veneers here, we're gonna do full crowns. This is a two millimeter depth cut burr. We're removing part of the mock-up where we open the occlusion. So most of our occlusal table will still be in enamel. It's really important to get that depth done properly. And then we'll use the chamfer burr to prep the interproximal, which takes care of the marginal ridge. Breaking the distal contact. I'm really careful when I do this. I'll go in and leave a thin sliver of enamel that just flakes away. So I'm going more for the cervical side of the margin and staying away from that adjacent tooth unless I want to recontour the adjacent tooth. And our next step is to finish the lingual. Quite often I'll use two hands when I'm prepping, particularly with the electric hand piece that provides a lot of stability. Once the lingual is prepared, we're going to blend in that lingual to the mesial and distal line the angles on the prep. It's kind of a sequence I go through. I prep very similar on all preps. Finish the labial, buckle first, interproximal, lingual, and then tie everything together. Check to make sure our reduction is even. And then the lingual incisal reduction is accomplished with a football diamond. This is to make sure we have equal reduction on the lingual so our ceramics are durable with the proper thickness of the ceramic you're desiring to use. Here we're gonna use a lithium disilicate and make sure we can place good lingual anatomy on our final restorations. Our first phase of preparation is going to be to the midline. This is an impressed crown that we're removing that's over 20 years old. And yes, I did that crown. Observe how good the adhesive interface still is. You'll notice that the impress does not flake away. In fact, we're going to leave some of the block out under the impress on this prep. This shows you adhesive dentistry at 20 some years out. You can see it's very stable. We did advance to a new diamond. It does require a good grit 
on the diamond to remove that impress and the video is sped up as well. We go through our same prepping protocol, label reduction, along with the incisal and then the interproximal and then tie in the lingual. I don't prep the two centrals together. As I mentioned earlier, I like contralateral side teeth to act as a reference in the overall prepping. It's all about getting a proper reduction for the ceramic that you want to place on these teeth for durability and aesthetics. Our next burr in the sequence of prepping is a carbide 1.6, same shape as the chamfer burr, and we're using it for burr curatage. We're also on dentin here. We could use a red diamond if we're still on enamel. The carbide burr is on the JK02 kit. It's really nice for lading those final margins. We'll control the bleeding with hemostatic gel, which is a 20 5% aluminum chloride. Final smoothing of the preps is accomplished with a white stone with water. We're using an RPM at 10,000. I love the white stone for finishing the line angles and creating a really nice smooth prep. Checking those preps, I'm using a loop at six magnification. I love to have that visual field, taking that white stone and just crafting those preps for nice smoothness. This is the way we do it and it works so well. Checking margins to make sure there's no abfraction ledges sub gingivally. Believe me, I've had that happen a number of times in my career, and then you have to go back and re-prep when you're checking the final restoration. Quite often with Prime Scan, and I did this with Omnicam, we'll go ahead and prepare the tissues at this time to take the impression of just the right side, because we can come back and add the left side impressions at a later time. This way I can control the anesthetic better. This is Retraction Capsule by 3M. I like the way that it retracts in a case like this. We'll leave it three to four minutes and it will provide excellent retraction after that burr curatage for the prime scan. You'll be able to read those margins extremely well. During the retraction wait, which is three to four minutes, we're going to go ahead and provide anesthetic on the other side. Rinsing away retraction capsule is simple. And you can see there's a nice sulcus after Burkuretage, which is going to provide an excellent optical impression with the Prime Scan. And this works really well for those that are still Omnicam users. And a final check to make sure there's no tissue tags that are just over those margins in just a little area, and then you'll have to go back and re image. So the final check, it looks good for a scan. I like to spend more time on prepping. I love to prep. It's been a craft of mine ever since the dental school, and we could spend more time on that. But I hope that video kind of developed a sequence. I also use a sequence when I scan. So you may have picked up with the prepping video that we prep the upper right side. We're going to scan that in using the cutout feature. And while I'm scanning, I've already anesthetized the other side, so it's waiting for that onset. And then I prep the left side, cut that area out on the software, and scan and build a complete model with segments. And I've been using that approach a long time for uh, Omnicam and Prime Scan, and it even works better. So let's go through the video for segmenting in the scans and how we can effectively use Prime Scan to build a very nice model and make the clinical flow really simple. Once the right side margins and tissues are addressed, we want that retraction. 
we did this with Burkuritage and Retraction Capsule by 3M. That's a retraction paste. Now we're ready to take the image. This is a pre-scan image prior to prepping. We're using that as our guide for design as well. We're going to cut out the zone that we want to image in. I like to cut it out rather than using the automated cutout feature. I just find that it scans a lot more e effectively this way. We'll start to scan over a non-prepped zone. The camera will start activating the scan and we will gather the data of the preps for the area that was cut out. I do find that once we scan a bit, you'll see the model still constructing, and that will sometimes slow down the capturing. So you just have to be patient with that. I find that more in the lower arch, particularly if it's the second arch that you're scanning in a full arch setup. Sate the patient up, make sure the arches are fitted together properly for the buckle scan bite registration. On the non-prep side, make sure it's scanned where you're not going to have teeth prepared. Otherwise that will resettle and the bite could be off. There are the margins after rendering. You can see they're very clean. There is a area of a tissue tag there on the mesial buckle. So I'm going to go back in and pack a cord, cut out that area and rescan that zone back in. That's one thing nice about digital impressions, particularly with prime scan. The left side preparations are completed. We'll go ahead and cut out that section on the model and add these preps to the model. That's one thing nice about the prime scan. We can do sectional impressions and build a model as we prepare. Managing soft tissue and aesthetic, I really like it for this approach. It's very efficient and simple to do. Render the margins. You'll see very clean margins. We're going to outline the first premolar just to demonstrate how clean these margins are. On the distal, that's at tissue level. It's easy to see. And that's how we obtain great milled margins. We know we nailed it when we were taking the impression and drawing the margins. Before we move into the software design, I want to go through a few principles. And this is a paper that was delivered a few years ago on biometrics microaesthetic determinants. And one thing I picked up from this paper was the ratio of contact embrasures to papillaries. And what does this have to do for us? Number one, it helps us to design. It helps us to learn how to structure those incisal embrasures and develop the contact points, particularly during the designs. As we work distal from the midline, we'll see that those incisal embrasures open up. Therefore, that lowers the contact point. And we see that consistent in really natural looking smiles. We have to have a conversation about this with patients to make sure their expectations are going to be met. The secret to reaching aesthetic harmony is to intentionally avoid asymmetry. And this is in a book by Dario Adolfi called Natural Aesthetics. It illustrates the fact that natural dentitions are asymmetrical. 
upper central incisors must be symmetrical within reasonable limits, lateral incisors and upper canines present larger variations and are frequently bilaterally asymmetrical in the same mouth. And that's what we see in a very natural dentition and we're going to build that into our virtual design. When I'm in my design theater, what we're going to do is set the arch up and make sure all the teeth fit, right? It's more of like a digital wax up just generally. We're not looking for the details yet. So once we get our teeth designed, then we work from the midline distal working on the proximal contacts and emergence. There's different ways to design large cases. Historically, I always used biocopy, right? So biocopy for me was a very predictable way to go. Now, it still is, but there's some hiccups with the software in the sense of where you have to really work with the emergence and the interproximal zones. Though I love biocopy, for this case, we're gonna use a combo. We're gonna use a combination of still having a biocopy model, but it's not gonna be for proposing. We're gonna use biogeneric individual then we'll use the link option and move the teeth around so it fits within that biocopy mold. Does that make any sense? And with that, we can move through this fairly expediently. And that's the workflow that I use. Align the arch first, then settle the midline out using the plumb line concept, and I'll explain that in just a moment. And then we work distal until we finish both sides, and then we mill. And that's how we work through this software workflow. In our administration screen, we'll set up our case, identify the teeth that will be prepared. Our acquisition, model access is to the biocopy, which is the provisionals. We'll outline the margins, and then we'll start designing our case. We're gonna use biogeneric individual in combination with biocopy. The proposal is biogeneric individual. And this is what it looks like. We turn on the biocopy model, and you can see we now have a guideline to tweak the biogeneric individual. So we'll use the link option and identify all the teeth. This allows them all to move together in harmony like an arch. We're going to use the position tool, move the whole arch out. That's what's nice about the link option. And then we can use individual positioning as well to get the general layout for all the teeth. Notice that we're using view options front global, which is the full arch, and that will get us back to the smile plane. We'll bring in the lingual thickness to the biocopy. We have the biocopy translucent that allows us to use the tools through the biocopy. Now we'll start setting up the interproximal. Let's turn on the 2D grid. We want to get the outline, the silhouette of the teeth, the proximal contacts. Now at this point in time of the software, I don't know why it just doesn't propose a good interproximal contact, particularly on a full crown prep like this but we do have to tweak it on some of the teeth, which is fine. We just go ahead and make the adjustments. So at this point in time, we're staying global by setting up the full arch, getting all the teeth in alignment with one another, getting the basic shape the way we want it. Since we did move these teeth forward with the link option using the position tool, the cervical emergence is full. Use the smooth tool at about 25 to 50 percent strength. Use a small paintbrush size and just smooth that over emergence down. The smooth tool can be used as a carving tool and I use that a lot in the emergence to create fullness and proper emergence and we toggle between the smooth and the add tool. We're still working the full arch, getting the big picture down, and then we'll go and start finishing the midline. Close the cervical embrasures from the lingual, as we do here on the centrals. For that lateral, that's an end-to-end -end bite area, and the lowers are transitionals we will adjust the lowers and keep the lateral at proper thickness. That's why you see the red mark on the incisal edge. 
The canine on the left side is end-to-end. -end. That's a crossbite, or it used to be. Use the four-directional tool and move the incisal tip on that canine so it's not in end-to-end -end or crossbite. Now we're going to look at the centrals. So once we get the full arch in basic alignment, look global first. We're going to choose number eight as our plumb line tooth. Finish the mesial on number eight using the 2D grid and also finish distal in approximal line angle. What we're going to do is blend the other teeth such as the central number nine to number eight. I've used this approach for years. Choose one of the centrals, make it plumb line. We're filling out and getting a fuller mesial emergence there on the midline zone. Toggle between the smooth and add tool, and the other tool I use is the two directional circular tool. That is my favorite tools in the arsenal. Spend your time on number eight since that's our plumb line tooth, and now we're ready to work on number nine. At this point in time, take the colors with the smooth tool, strength at 25 to 50 percent, and a smaller paintbrush size, smooth it down to the green color. Aqua is my color that I leave to finish in. And then the removal tool at 10%, take the green down to aqua. And that will give you a nice smooth contact. Same on the distal. Smooth tool, 25 to 50%. And you can see that midline is coming together really nice. Our concept in working down the arch is finish the centrals first. So we finish number eight. And then we blended number nine to number eight. We finished the distal of number nine and then we build the mesial of the lateral to the distal of the central. And sequentially just finish each tooth as you go distal. We're going to leave the lingual incisal edge a bit strong since we're going to remove that from the lower arch. This is an area that is end to end or it was and we're going to create a normal overjet. So we'll modify the lure. We've finished the lateral, building the canine to the distal of the lateral, using our smooth and removal tools accordingly to accomplish our aqua color. Now in my milling unit, in the way I mill, aqua allows these to drop right in. We'll flatten the distal of the lateral, then build the mesial of the canine to the lateral. Sequentially go down the arch. This makes it really consistent. The smooth tool at 50% is an excellent carving tool. Keep the paintbrush size small so it doesn't remove the labial anatomy. Just use it mainly on the line angles and margins. We'll focus our attention to the canine. The four directional tool is a nice tool to move the cusp tips. We want that cusp tip a little bit more to the mesial. So use the four directional circular tool. And since we move that canine to the labial, we'll thicken the lingual using the minimal thickness as our guide for the proper emergence. And we can move that central groove to the middle of the tooth to keep that groove more a harmony to the buccal and lingual dimensions. We're finishing the mesial of the canine and we can see we got a little thin. So what we're going to do is balk that up and go back to the distal of the lateral and remove some there so we don't get too thin. You do have to pay attention to minimal thickness if you're prepping conservatively. And that's how you work the minimal thickness out if you see it too thin. Aqua is a good consistent color for the way I finish the restorations. Bulk out any thin margins on the buckle of the canine that may appear too thick, but it's okay. We'll thin that down after it mills. We're doing that to avoid chipping. Finish the distal of the canine, make it flat, and then we'll build the mesial of the premolar to the canine. It's so sequential. 
have an idea on your preference for incisal and cuspal embrasures. We're using the smooth tool to carve that, establish proper thickness on the margins. We're going to leave a strong contact on the lingual cusp and adjust the lower. The lower is in provisionals. This is a full mouth case and we're working through the upper eight first. We're finishing out the buccal emergence and then we'll complete the interproximal contacts. I find that when I'm doing cases like this on a premolar, we could use the automatic contact adjusting tool. I find that the smooth and removal tool work better. We're building that lingual cusp up so we don't have a negative curve of speed, and then we'll adjust the lower accordingly. This patient is a horizontal chewer. We're finishing up the premolar to be ideal, and then we'll build the lower tooth to that shape. Now we're ready to complete the contralateral side. We're going to use a time-lapse approach here since we've already seen the action. We're going to start on the mesial of the lateral to finish to the distal of the central and work accordingly, working back to the premolar. So this is in time-lapse mode. I wish I was this quick all the time. Mount the lower arch and see if we need to make any more tweaks. I do see the canine on the right side a little tipped in, so we're going to use the four directional tool and just move that out and adjust the contacts again. Even though we had the guide of the biocopy, which is what the patient felt good with, which is the shapes of the mock up, the prototype, and the provisionals, we still have a little latitude to be creative here. This is really another digital wax up, but we're using the prior biocopy as our guide. We provide more perfection with the final wax up. This is what we'll mill from. Doing our final tweaks. Thicken that margin. Also check the minimal thickness on the closal table. We're bringing the central grooves up on both premolars for the materials. And there's our design. I think we are now ready to mail. Here are the mailed restorations seated on a model. They just dropped in. We basically didn't have to touch any of the contacts. Now we're ready to do our finessed finishing on our ceramics and then we'll fire them. Our next section is about dental material choices and finishing techniques. I want to make a few comments about materials because our initial objectives defined uh, a shade selection, the enamel preservation. Those two objectives have a huge impact on which material we're going to choose because if I want to go really thin, I want a lithium disilicate. If I want a really good blockout material, I like more of a lucite or a microfels pathic within the options that we have today. I really like the fels pathic. These are the Vita blocks. Here we replace two centrals and they just blend in so well with just some stain and glaze. I like lucites, particularly the multi blocks because with those I have the natural gradation design within the ceramic and it works really nice. I'm even using composite as a transitional smile now, particularly with smile design and brighter teeth. We have nice bleach options within our lithium disilicates if we're going conservative. And then there's Sequonia, which I'm using more and more for anterior zones. Here we have a premolar zone with a Zircad multi-block, customized, and you can see it's starting to look really nice. And this is where we're going with materials. But regardless of the material you use, the most important thing is choosing a material that's going to have the strength and the structure and the block out 
capability if you need that, but you have to know how to shape it in. So I'm going to spend the last few moments of our time together here on shaping in a ceramic. When shaping in a ceramic, each different type and brand of ceramic has its own characteristics. This is a translucent disilicate. This is amber male. I usually start on either the centrals or work distal from the premolar. In a premolar, you'll find that there's a subtle depression on the mesial and distal. These are primary depressions. Each tooth will have its own characteristics. Each mouth has its own characteristics. What we're wanting to do is establish unity. Since we have full control, we're going to be creative. On the mesial and distal emergence, there's usually a subtle secondary concavity. This premolar is a little shorter than the contralateral premolar. The longer the premolar, the more room you have to work that through. I love working on the cusp edges. Subtle depressions, which would highlight where mammalons come together, are often there on premolars. It's a way to make it look more natural. On the occlusal surface, this is an inverted cone. It's a centered diamond. We're refining the occlusal anatomy. On this case, this patient is a horizontal chewer. A class three. Occlusal surfaces are a little flatter. With the milling right burr, which is a cone burr at 45 degrees, we don't see the full anatomy that would show up on the digital design. I like to carve that back in. It's more of a personal taste. It's a lot of fun to do. A little more thinning at the secondary depressions and smooth out all the shaping that has been accomplished up to this point. Notice we scrub a lot. Scrub, I'll say this several times, scribe and scrub keeps your ceramic looking harmonious. As we turn a corner to the anterior segment of this case, for canines, it's helpful to map your shaping objectives. You'll see that on the mesial and distal, there's distinctive primary depressions. In the cervical one-third, you'll see secondary depressions and then mark where you want the pericomata. One of my favorite shaping burrs is a straight cylinder with a rounded edge. It's large enough to allow you to keep sweeping motions, and when you're starting your primary depressions, they're wider for mesial distal at the incisal edge, and then they feather out and fade into the mid-body and the cervical one-third. You'll notice that we use a scribe and scrubbing motion. So once we scribe the shape in, we scrub afterwards to blend in all the motions to keep it looking more natural. It's a really nice technique to use. On the cervical one-third, we're adding the secondary depressions. We're highlighting those. It's a sweeping motion. In most cases, secondary depressions you'll observe from the contralateral side of the tooth. So like on the distal, you'll see it from the mesial. There are subtle depressions. Most natural teeth have these. It's a nice feature to add. It will just raise the bar of your case quickly. Kamada, it's a light dance of the tip of the burr across the ceramic surface. Make it look unplanned. A light touch, a light scrub will blend all the shaping together. So we shape and we scrub. That's a more refined look. Now we're ready to move to the next teeth in our project and that would be the laterals and the centrals. Texture mapping the primary and secondary depressions on the centrals and laterals. Centrals, there's two, mesial and distal. 
and then we'll dominate a secondary depression on the distal. On a lateral, we see mainly a mesial-focused primary depression. Usually there's one and the secondary depression. Starting on the lateral, we use a light sweeping motion from the sagittal edge into the main body of the tooth by pushing and scribing and then scrubbing once we've scribed. This is the cylinder round ended burr. It's my favorite. It's large enough to keep your motions nice and gentle and you get a lot done with a few strokes. Secondary depression on the distal. It's 45 degrees from the labial surface. A subtle sweeping motion, blending that in to the primary depression on the direct labial. Mesial and distal depressions on the central. Start at the incisal edge. Use a sweeping motion and push it into the mid body of the tooth. This will keep that nice flow of where the depression is fuller, more mesial distal width from the incisal as it thins out and fades out in the mid body to the cervical side of the tooth. Each central is different. When you're trying to match one central to a natural tooth next door, we have to take more note of these principles. When you're doing a case like this, you have the freedom to really give it some creativity. Our secondary depression on the distal, blend in the pericamata, a light dance of the burr, and scrubbing across the ceramic surface. And that's the effective way to get this done. And then we polish the line angles and the margins. This is the green coarse polishing wheel. This is on the Meisinger JK03 kit. It's a nice system. The silicone polisher has a nice feel to it. It's easy to control the margin, not over polish that edge. We are polishing away the margin thickness parameter from the machining of the ceramic. With the polish effect, that central has a nice, complete, finished look. We'll work down the arch on the next tooth, polishing the margins and line angles, keeping those margins nice and crisp. Using magnification, you can precisely see where those margins are so the margins aren't over-polished, which we don't want to do. Final step before firing, incisal refinements. Using the green knife edge wheel, create some nice contouring, take away that perfectly straight look, give it character, give it some age, keep it asymmetrical, subtle definitions, subtle depressions on the incisal edges and line angles. I'll often further refine this approach once these restorations are seated and we can observe the smile from a complete standpoint. This is the way we keep it natural. I see the need to round number eight just a tad bit more on the distal. A little more of a rounded edge on that central. Though this central is narrower, we want to make it look harmonious. And quite often, as I've mentioned in other lectures and videos, Teeth from right to left counterparts are not exactly the same size and shape, but we want to keep them harmonious so they look like they fit into the lineup. Crystallization sure gives a different look, particularly with amber mill. We now have our primary color. We can further assess our contouring and address any changes we want to do at this point in time.
The overall shaping is close to what I see for the objectives of this case. I do want to do a little more polish on those line angles, make them smoother. Even when you're going to glaze, let's finish the surface underneath the glaze as much as you can so you can use a thin glaze or we could polish and just finish our restorations that way. Going back to the green knife edge wheel, you'll see those line angles come alive as we refine the post crystallization surface texture. Further polishing of the margins will finish that portion of the restoration for us. Whether we're polishing or glazing, it's nice to have that nice crisp polish appearance. And polish the lingual. Quite often, polishing is the best way to finish the lingual component of these restorations. It will provide an excellent wear surface. Our next step is to bevel the lingual and sizal edge. There are several things we're accomplishing here. Number one is it will provide a more natural appearance. Number two is going to provide a better functioning restoration and protrusive. And that way the lingual and sizal edge is not a speed bump. This will actually decrease the trauma under function to that incisal ledge. When the case demands, the inverted cone provides a nice linear depression effect. Don't make it even in depth from the incisal to the cervical component of the line, but just create a nice definition. And we can add some pericomata as well and some horizontal line action if the surface texturing demands this type of finishing. With that refined finishing, you can see the difference from the adjacent teeth. So we'll go ahead and follow that same pattern for the other teeth to get a nice finished shaping appearance. And then we can decide how we want to finish the final surface, either polish, add some stain and glaze to the incisal edges. Here we're gonna use meal for this case. And quite often I'll add incisal effects and polish the whole surface, or we can finish the surface off with just a glazed surface after we add the incisal effects, and that will be in another video. Tell you, there's nothing like shaping in a good restoration. Just a little change in the scenery as we wrap this time together up. I appreciate you watching. Let's just review what we talked about. It was a lot of concepts and we could have spent a lot more time. First of all, make sure you set your case up. I hope we made that clear. I did review a few pointers that are really important to me that I've learned through the years, and that's really getting emotional closure with a client pre-planning a case. It's your guide to prep, it's your guide to emotional closure, and it's also your guide to proposing. The clinical flow in the software isn't hard. This technique I used for the presentation today is more about using the features within the CEREC software, but always having your prototype in the biocopy catalog to direct your design, and then you set the arch up, you design the midline, and work distally. We have a plethora of materials today. I really appreciate all the companies that support us, and this will continue to grow as we go through our journey with this technology. Each ceramic has a little different feel as you use your burr on it and do the micro surface texturing and the contouring. But Amber Mill is a new lithium diacylicate on the
the market. It does mill extremely well. I'm still getting used to calibrating the color system. The technique we use for shaping is applicable to all different types of ceramics. If you have any questions or comments, I want to hear them. The best way to reach me is to go to the Clemminstitute.com and in the contact section, there's a message center and that gets right to my phone. And that's the easiest way for me to get back to you folks. So thanks for watching. I wish you the best in this journey and let's stay in touch.